Okay. Oh. So, uh, quiz four average it was a uh, seventy one seventy one percent. We'll have quiz five in two weeks. Um, you'll see a little bit more of that again. I've uploaded the solutions. Um, you'll need to apply conservation of linear momentum and mass, but this time towards things that are either rotating or sending fluid where the fluid has energy. I will talk about those two conservation equations today. But those basic concepts of being able to calculate the flux and using vectors, you have to do. In particular, for angular momentum, you're going to have to do um, rotating coordinate frames. And we'll do a problem like that today. Um, uh, and there's a nice problem in the homework. I'll give you some practice. So quiz five, you can expect uh, conservation of angular momentum. I'll just actually write it out just the first time. <laughs> Conservation of energy. Um, well, plenty of time to practice. I actually consider quiz five a little bit easier than quiz four. Um, conservation of angular momentum is, uh, again, like quiz four. It's a, you're trying to figure out angular momentum, which is a vector quantity. But conservation of energy is a scalar. So you just have to track how much energy you're changing in the system. I couldn't get the dot cam to work. Um, but um, let's do this warm up with this sprinkler problem. So, this is a 5.87 in the book. All right, let me, uh, I'm going to try to draw kind of a All right, so this is supposed to be rotating in the plane, basically in this plane. Um, if, you've had, if you've seen these lawn sprinklers, uh, you basically, I've got one in my pocket. It's, it's a little bit small. It'd be better if the dot cam, dot cam was working. But um, you see this thing, it's got three, it's got, um, basically you blow into here, and then these each have little jets, and they push, push it out. I'll stand back so that people out in blue jeans can see. And um, uh, this is basically a way you can use fluid momentum to power this rotating. Because let's say you've got you know, suburb, suburbs, you've got this big lawn, and you don't want to have the hose go back and forth. So you put fluid in this way, and then this is fine. Okay, let me just do that again. Okay, so why is it spinning? The reason why it spins has to do with the orientation needed to these nozzles. So that's what I basically have drawn here. And um, if anyone doesn't like their course project and wants to do like a bigger, better version of this that people can actually see, the dot cam used to work last. The dot cam doesn't work with blue jeans, but um, uh, last year we had basically three nozzles of different angles, and um, you can see it rotates differently with each angle. But this one had just kind of suffered, and it's just falling apart. Um, okay, so that's so what I've drawn there is kind of a, a view of that. Um, and let's draw let's also draw a top view because in the end we just care about the top view here. Okay. So um, imagine you've got your garden hose fluids going up here. And it's going out through these edges. Now I'm just going to draw the outlets. Okay. And um, let's see. There are three parts of this problem. Um, so first, you're given 
the area of each nozzle. So you're given A. Um, A is equal, is there, it's pretty small. O, O4 inch squared. Given your flow rate, um, now this gets to a conservation of energy problem. Um, the hose that comes out of your house, that little faucet, doesn't actually prescribe flow rate, it just prescribes pressure. Um, but you have losses as it goes down the hose. So if you've got a hose that's like a thousand feet long, you can get very little flow rate. If you've got like a reasonably length hose, you can get um, this, this flow rate here. Okay. And uh, we have this R, which I'm gonna, I'm going to draw from the, the center here to the center of these, this nozzle. So again, like the um, other problems, we really just care about solving a 1D problem. Um, and that's going to be an approximation for what's going on at each of these two ends here. Okay. So R is 8 inches. Okay. So you're given those dimensions, the flow rate, and you're supposed to calculate a couple things. Um, All right, so as you saw, when I blew through the sprinkler, um, when I blew through the sprinkler, it spun. So I want to know if someone had their imaginary finger pushing it in the right direction. How much does that finger have to, how much force or how much torque, torque given by the force and the radius, how much torque do they have to apply so it doesn't spin? So that's the first resisting torque. Um, um, The next one is the next one is you're letting it go a little bit. So let's say your finger is kind of squishy, or instead of your finger, you've got some kind of basically friction. And as a result, you're applying some constant torque, but it's not enough to keep it stationary. And as a result, it's spinning at some constant revolution, 500 revolution per minute. I don't know if the springers actually go that fast. It seems kind of fast to me. I'd expect them more like 100, 200. All right. If, uh, no velocity, if no resisting torque. And the last one is, if you don't have any resisting torque, uh, what's the natural frequency that it's going to spin? So let's say I just manufactured this thing super, super well, so it's got zero friction. Like, if I build this thing, what frequency is it going to spin? Okay. So these three questions, you're going to have to use stationary control volumes and a moving control volume. Uh, clearly, the first one is stationary, but the second one is moving at some prescribed frequency. Okay. All right, so let's um, introduce the governing equations. All right, so you can't use um, conservation of linear momentum here because it's, it's spinning. So the best thing is to apply the following equation. Let's make this a little neater. So this is going to be R underlying. R cross U, rho dV, 
Are those cross products? Yes, they are. yeah, they are. They're little carrots. Um, they're cross products. Yeah, that's how. Um, uh, yeah, that that's how I do them. Um, rate of change. So everything in the parentheses is, is basically the, the uh, quantity that you're tracking. You remember Reynolds transport theorem? Before we had that equal to be um, just the velocity, right? If you just take away the r's and you take away the r's, you just have velocity and conservation of momentum. <clears throat> and instead of um, you know, like the rocket problem, the rocket problem was basically this rocket shooting momentum down. And that provided force up. Here, your rocket's spinning, and you're shooting stuff at an angle. You're shooting stuff at a radius downward, yeah, like this. And that's going to cause you to spin. But otherwise, the main concepts are the same. You've got basically one that's keeping track of how much uh, angular momentum is changing the system. Let's say you had a reservoir. Let's say if this thing was a big spinning, um, I don't know, teapot or something like that, and it's really losing its its fluid, but it's, but here it's it's actually not. And and flux is basically when you're shooting it out. And this first version is going to be for stationary control. So just like for conservation of linear momentum, the force was that required to keep the control volume stationary. This is, required, this is the torque applied so that the control volume doesn't spin. <clears throat> All right, so where does this come from? Um, it basically comes from conservation of linear momentum, and they just take R across the entire equation. Okay. So you know um, this Newton's law, um, but it can also be written like this, where instead where you, you, you have a moving particle. And I'm writing MA as basically the um, material derivative of the momentum of that particle. Where this is m m times u. So you've probably seen this before that uh, that force is dp dt, and that's basically that's what this is, except for it's a moving object. Um, so using that um, that expression, like I said, we just take r across. Um, this thing. So I'll also tell you that conservation of angular momentum and constant elastic momentum, they come from each other. So this doesn't really give you any new information. You're generally going to use just use one of those equations, angular or linear, to solve the problem. They don't, it doesn't give you new information if you use the other one. All right. So, so basically the trick that makes this um, into the follow the top form is basically simplifying the simplifies th this thing. So So this is, um, is it, what is it called when you take the derivative of a cross of a product? It ends in the word rule, product rule. Yeah, so you take the derivative of the first part times that, derivative of the second part times the first part. So that's what I'm going to do. Rho of dv plus r plus d dt rho. Oh, 
All right, so I've just distributed the derivative to these two parts. Now, if you want a little picture to think about well, what this looks like, it's basically, um, you got your particle there, got some velocity u, and um, the particle's moving around, that's why we have to use the material derivative. And this is equal to u, right? The change in rate in the position versus time, the derivative of the position respect to time is the velocity. And um, therefore, this thing is zero, since u cross u. Any um, u cross u is basically, it's the, um, the area of the parallelogram formed by the basically uh, uh, cause function of those vectors, is, but if u is cross itself, it's going to be zero. All right. Okay. So. Next slide. All right. So basically, we've got that term is equal to this term. And um, if we integrate that this this thing, you can move um, the derivative outside. And if you do that, you basically get the, the finished form. But now we just use the Reynolds transport there. Um, Reynolds transport there um, tells us this, where you compare what's going on with the system to what's going on with control volume, and you take them coinciding at the same moment in time. Okay. So that's where I'll transport there. <clears throat> and this thing is equal to um, R cross F on the control line. And that's the finished. That's the finished expression. Okay. So I, I kept the R cross U in parentheses just to, so you keep in mind that the form of this equation is very similar to the form that you have you have before. And uh, we're going to use two forms of this: one where you have the U's, and the other one that you replace this U dot N with a W dot N, which is the flux when it's moving. So does this look good? Are we ready to apply it to the problem? Let's do that on the fourth board. Not that board for us. Yeah, just they actually fix this thing. Let's see. All right. All right, so Let's think about the force to keep this thing stationary. So, if 
by right hand rule, we'll consider this to be positive. Okay, so if it spins, if it spins um, clockwise, uh, that's counterclockwise. Kind of the way I've drawn this thing, it actually wants to spin in the opposite direction, right? Oh no, actually no, that's right. It doesn't want to spin. Fluid's going to be going out this way, and you basically want to imagine with conservation angular momentum problems, they're usually symmetric. So that means you really don't need to care about the left and right ends together. Just consider the right ends. And uh, you just really want to consider it at a single moment in time where you've got fluid injecting out of here. Let's say it didn't have this radius thing attached to it. It would want to go that way, like a rocket. So in some ways, you can see conservation linear momentum acting, but because it's constrained to pivot around this point, it's got to see. But if you want to ever figure out the direction it goes, you just look at this thing, imagine it's a rocket. If you're throwing fluid out there, it's going to be going in the down that direction. So it's going to be going in the positive direction. Okay. So the first thing is the uh, contributing momentum is couched in velocities. So what you really want to do is write the magnitude of velocity over um, the area of the nozzle. And here, this is the so this area. This is the number of nozzles. The fluid is distributed equally. The reason I put that capital N there, because in the homework, I think you have three nozzles. Um, I believe in another problem in the homework, either that or in the back of the book, there's a, a washing machine. Raise your hand if you've got a washing machine at home. Does it, the, does anyone actually wash dishes by hand? Oh, you guys probably wash dishes by hand because you don't have that many. Who washes by hand? Okay. Well, if you have like five people, then you got to use the washing machine. But inside the washing machine is exactly the same principle, except instead of having one hole, it's got da -da -da -da, all these little holes. And uh, each one of them gives a little bit more, a little bit spin. And I think on one, one year, I basically asked people to calculate what's the amount of spin just given the number of holes. So you basically want to distribute. Um, and in this case, you, um, I'm going to have it in the theta hat direction, and based on my coordinate system that being positive, it's going to be going out in the negative direction. Does that make sense? So the, the device wants to spin positive theta, so this is positive theta, but it, the fluid is coming out negative theta hat direction. You really want to start to use um, the theta and R coordinate system for these problems because once you do the cross projects, it'll be easier. Um, and the other thing, I could have drawn this in any orientation. I could have drawn it, pointed that way, that way, or that way. It really doesn't matter. But just for your own sanity, you basically want to orient it so that it's really easy for you to calculate the cross products. Yeah? Um, why is it that you don't have any kind of angle for um, when you're considering you in the theta hat direction? Like any kind of angle because it's not explicitly in just the theta hat orientation, at least in the picture on board one where it has an angle. It seems like it's not going explicitly around in the theta hat direction. So why is it, why is the potential tied that way? Um, so the way I've drawn it, so you're right. So there, this could be uh, some angle alpha. Right now I've chosen alpha is equal to 90 degrees. So all of the momentum is basically causing it to rotate. You could consider three possible problems for this problem. So one, so here, let me draw alpha equals 90 degrees. And I think that is, um, so alpha is equal to 90 degrees. <laughs> so I'll draw two other sprinklers. Um, basically what alpha is equal to, um, let's see, that would be, uh, 180, and this would be alpha is equal to, alpha is equal to, um, not exactly, 90 plus, uh, 90 plus 40, 135. Um, which one do you think is going to spin the most? Yeah, yeah, this one. Because uh, this one, basically, the R, and the U are, per are perpendicular. So you basically don't need to, or cross U is gonna be the magnitude of each, of each one. 
Um, here R and U are in the same direction. So here R cross U is actually equal to zero. So like if I actually made this thing had a putty and I and I move the like basically if I had this spinning pipe, it's not gonna spin, it's just gonna shoot fluid out. Um, and this one's gonna be some kind of compromise between the two. Not as much as this, because you basically the um, you only get the component of fluid that's going, so you have this. Yeah, people can actually see that. The only component that matters is the vertical one. So this one has a sort of some, somewhere in between. So you're right, if we basically did have some alpha of like non-zero, non-90 alpha, you would have to take into account. And um, you would take that into account in the um, R cross U, but not in the flux term. So we would, we would sort of still keep U defined like this. Um, when we get to the flux term, I'll, I'll talk about where we, we do that. Would you just write it as like R, like the magnitude of of R and U times sine of 35, 135 for that last one to get the cross product? R cross U is the R, R U sine of, um, sine what? 135. 135. Is that basically? I think sine of 135 is going to give you zero. That's good. Nine gives you one. Um, yeah, that seems like it should be okay. Okay. And we'll get, so this is pretty important. You wanna, U is always the amount that's fluxing out. Um, you always wanna define U that contains all the fluid. And the angle of this thing will be determined when we look at the, how much angular momentum each one of those fluid particles has. So you don't wanna double count it. Um, all right, so now we've talked about this. So, so the amount that's leaving is equal to rho times Q. Um, M, so M total, that's the amount that's leaving. And the amount from each arm, M dot, is gonna be rho Q over N. Obviously that's another area where people may be messed up if they did this on the homework. Um, it's keeping in mind that you basically have less, uh, you have less fluid coming out from each. So this is basically saying the same thing as this, except we're just not in that area. And we're multiplying by the density to get the fluid. All right, so the very first, um, when there's no, there's no momentum, angular momentum being stored in the system, everything is leaving that's coming in. So we have the following, so T shaft, which is equal to R cross F, Row. Requires us to look at how much, to look at two things. This expression has two things. This is m dot. And this is how, so this is literally how much fluid is leaving your control volume. It doesn't matter um, what direction is it, just how much flux is leaving. And this is, this term is how much angular momentum per mass each of those particles have. Right. And so that's how we calculate how much angular momentum is leaving. Okay. Um, so you can also write R is equal to um, I think we called it capital R in the very beginning. R hat, right? So you've got R cross R cross R R hat cross theta dot. You get um, negative R, and I'll use the notation capital U, uh, lowercase U because that we we've, we've been doing. So this one, the only thing that you get out of this is um, so if you did have the non-zero ones, then you'd have the sine of theta, the sine of alpha here, um, but we're just gonna do the 90 degree one. And then times m, m dot. Times m dot. Um, and uh, times z hat. So this uses the fact that r hat cross theta hat is equal to z hat. Right. 
That's the that's the right hand rule. Remember, R is going this direction, theta is going that direction. That gives you basically this thing's the the angular momentum vectors kind of come uh, out of the board and arrow towards. All right, now we just substitute. Uh, all right, the m dot was a row q n. So negative r first u is a u over a n. Um, um, and this is rho q n. Z hat. All right. All right. So I have the number of heads here, and then this is the this is a uh, this the R U, and this is the um, M dot from each head. You know, there's probably more straightforward ways to do it. You can just, but you either have to take a per head approach and then multiply by the number of heads. Um, and that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing here. Uh, what does it say? Uh, I'm going to rewrite it up here. All right. The board too. All right. So. So we call, so, and the number of heads. Um, and the velocity r, um, r times the velocity coming out of each um, and then times the m dot from each one. So this is number of heads and this is r u from each head and this is the m dot uh, for each head. All right. And uh, this one's got to be divided by n, um, and this one's divided by n too. So. Isn't there a negative in there? Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. I draw my negative. All right. So that gives you negative row. We put the row in the front. Um, R q squared over a n. Uh, and it, it could be that you can write the z hat direction as the vector of your So that is the um, torque whole screen for stationary. And um, basically, pictorially, basically, it wants to rotate this way, and you got to basically put your finger pushing it down that way. And just putting it on one side is enough. You gotta apply that much torque um, to keep it to keep it from moving. So this is part A. And it's kind of ugly because we had the Q in there, but um, it's probably easier to just write the whole problem with U and then substitute. All right. So any questions on how to do this part A? How we did it? So remember. Basically, we got to figure out this expression, but this is integrated over the control surface. So, so to be super explicit, we basically have this control surface that's going around everything, and um, basically we got fluid leaving on both uh, both parts. But every time fluid leaves, it provides the same contribution. That's where the first n comes from. We got n heads. In this case, the n is equal to two. Once you count for that, then you basically are doing the same exact thing for each head. You calculate 
the amount of angular momentum that fluid has, and that's given by the velocity and this, norm, this r vector. When they're 90 degrees, you don't have a sign term. And then you figure out how much flux, like just literally how much fluid is leaving per unit time uh, in terms of mass. Right? That's rho times u times a, and that gives you this thing. And um, once uh, if the things are angled, this m dot does not change, but this does change. You have the sign term. And the last thing to keep, keep track of is the r cross u is a vector. So you need a, a vector here. And the notation we have is r hat times d, cross d hat c hat. This is good? OK. We will return to angular momentum coordinate systems, this coordinate system in the very end of the course, quiz D. Favorite quiz seven, the end for some of you. You guys okay on Blue Jeans World? Any other questions on this before we do part B? So is theta hat just going in the counterclockwise direction? Yeah, theta hat is, is theta hat Positive theta hat, so theta hat's going this way. I mean, in general, r hat is this way and theta hat is this way. That's what we call positive, positive r hat and positive theta hat, positive, right? That's what we just find as positive theta hat. And so the fluid's leaving in the negative theta hat direction uh, because this thing is spinning. In reality, it doesn't matter though, right? It's just based off your coordinate system, right? What doesn't matter? Like you could say that the uh, neg or sorry, positive theta directions in the clockwise direction. Uh, it, yeah. It wouldn't matter. Yeah, then if you did say it was positive, then basically your z hat would be going into the board. But that would be, I would say the most intuitive is to have it basically drawn like this, the theta hat going positive. Of course, I mean, there are some years I give a quiz that is basically intentionally, like you basically could have a sprinkler that is like this one. So this thing, the fluid wants to go this way and the sprinkler wants to spin that way. Then that would be a good chance to use that other direction. Okay, now let's talk about when it's moving. So when it's moving, so now it's prescribed to move at a constant frequency, omega. So part B, um, we ought to be a little careful with the notation. So angular uh, frequency, wait, uh, is that angular velocity? Or angular velocity. Angular velocity. Omega, and it's, it is at 500 revolutions per second. Per minute. Oh, per minute. Oh, yeah. I wonder it's, that's still pretty fast. Thanks. So you're allowing it to spin um, at this prescribed speed. Um, so what, what that's going to do is this thing, this, this control volume now is now spinning. This thing, is, this thing is moving. Of course you can't draw it moving, but imagine it's, it's moving. And so a couple of things are gonna change. Uh, in particular, we're gonna use this version of the equation here. So this is um, a concentration of angular momentum with no storage or moving control line. Now this term is the same, um, but what has changed is that now you have to keep track, you basically have to keep track of two different things. One is the amount of stuff that's leaving the control volume. So you have to keep track of this W, which is the relative velocity leaving the control volume. 
But the torque that actually affects you is basically still given by the velocity in the regular in the non moving frame. So this is the um, flux from moving control volume. And this is the um, there's angular momentum per mass per mass in stationary frame. And the torque here, this is not the torque to keep it stationary because it's no longer stationary, but it's the torque to keep it moving at a rotating at a steady speed. Torque to rotating at a steady speed. And it's exactly analogous to the rocket problem. And uh, what was the other one we did? Rocket problem and uh, that we had a moving angled plate. But uh, as long as you're not accelerating, and this is sort of still steady state, that's the torque required. And you don't want to imagine this as a finger, because your finger, if you put it in the sprinkler, would get chopped off. Or if it wouldn't get chopped off, it would just hurt. You imagine this as a constant frictional torque that's being applied. But the key thing to realize is that this is the flux out of the moving control volume. Uh, imagine if you're an ant, so you're like literally like a ant here. You're watching the fluid leave. Um, that's the angular. That's the capital W, the relative velocity that you care about. Um, okay. So that's a big concept. If you get that concept, then this problem will not be that hard. Now what we have to do is, where does um, angular velocity omega enter the problem? And then there's a the problem here, because, uh, sorry, point. And there's here because the amount of flux is going to change u, because u is u is going to be experienced by both uh, is going to be a function of both how quickly the frame is moving and how quickly the stuff leaving the frame. So that's given by this um, definition of of uh, relative velocity. So this is very, very common, um, that you're going to go back and forth between relative velocity and, and uh, velocity in the steady frame. And there's really no escape. I think the last quiz I said you wouldn't have to use moving frames. But any time you've got angular momentum, you pretty much do have to use a moving frame. All right, so we define the relative velocity that's so. So this is a relative velocity. This is the velocity in the stationary frame. That's going to determine how much um, angular momentum, how much torque you need. And this is the uh, velocity of the control volume. Okay. And that's where our omega is going to come in. You can also rewrite the same exact thing as this. The speed of your uh, speed in your stationary frame is just equal to how quickly your frame is moving plus, oh, sorry, how quickly your frame is moving plus how quickly you're leaving fluid from that frame. Okay. And uh, let's draw this. We'll draw this problem one more time here. So they told us that it's spinning, and we already know from the previous problem it's going to spin in this direction. They told us it's spinning at a frequency omega. And so the speed here is simply r omega times theta hat. Uh, that's the speed, so because we know that, and we really only care about the speed at the exit, because that's where everything's calculated. So remember, this thing is r, capital R. And it's like, if you imagine you're a frisbee or a merry-go-round, it's a, you know, the, your merry-go-round is like 12 feet wide, and it's just going at like, you know, 10 revolutions a second. Uh, this is basically, actually, for this to be right, this should be omega in radians. But I don't want to write too high, because it's going to get confusing. So we'll just say omega in radians. 
convert that to radians. And that tells you how many revolution, how much um, speed you have per second. And I have the appropriate direction. And W is as we had before. Negative Q over A N theta hat from the first problem. Remember, it's basically you're taking the, all the volumetric flux and you're forcing it out nozzle of area A, and you've got 10 nozzles. So this is the same thing we had before. And one thing should be clear to you is that um, W W is basically the opposite direction of um, the UCV. And that should make sense. Just like a rocket goes in the opposite direction that you're shooting fluid, these are, two, these are opposing. So this problem you have, this is the thing you have to realize, that you can only figure out these two things. You really only know how much stuff is leaving the control frame that's here. And you only know how quickly your control frame is moving. This right-hand side prescribed. It's the, they told you it's moving that at the frequency rate. So let's just combine these. R omega minus Q over A N. And that's as simple as it gets. And this is basically, if you're far, far away, that's the speed that you see leaving the sprinkler. Um, so again, taking this little device analogy, you know, the faster, the faster I spin this, um, the more it's going to be affecting here. The problem that we solved originally in part A was with omega is equal zero, and the velocity was simply just equal to uh, what we had before. Okay, and so. When you're spinning it, it means that in your stationary frame, you're seeing less, effectively less velocity, because it's basically this thing is, is kind of killing some of your velocity. All right, so let's do the problem now. Um, Shaft torque um, is equal to negative r uh, integral c s r cross u um, rho w dot n hat d a. So this is just m dot. That's what we had before, right? And um, Then now the top part, we've got R cross this, and we'll say that's in the theta direction. So R cross, the so R times R omega minus Q over A N Z hat. We'll put the Z hat by the end. And M dot we had as before, um, rho Q over N Z hat, and multiply the number of heads. So this is number of heads. This is um, R cross U. And this is M dot for each head. Another key thing is this M dot didn't change. This M dot is the same as before. Everything that's coming in is leaving. So this M dot is the same. OK, so if we were to simplify this, you get Rho R Q times R omega minus Q over A N Z hat. So it's whatever whatever this thing was this thing is. All right. So part C asks, um, would be the uh, Frequency that it would naturally spin if there were no torque. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. This has not actually been very useful in this course. Uh, Doctor Who. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, so uh, where you wrote m dot, that is that rho q divided by yeah. the number. Yeah. It's the same as before. Rho times q times n. Okay. 
make it a little bit more clear. Yeah. Diagram for you wrote W going upwards. Is that supposed to be UCB? Oh, this is supposed to be omega. If you, omega. if you wrote just a straight upwards um, velocity, would that be UCB? Yeah. If I here, this would be UCB. Okay. Let's put it in a different color. This is getting kind of crowded. Uh, but yeah, UCV Which is omega R. Is omega R. Um, because ultimately you've got to calculate, you've got to consider all these problems, you're just considering a single point that you're doing everything. So that would be this point X. We're considering the UCV there, um, the U there, and all, every, all the other stuff there. That's sort of the main point of the problem. Um, okay, so that's how much, so this is the resisting torque. such that um, rotates at, at omega. So, it, and this is less than the previous value. If you remember the previous problem that we did, part B, it didn't have this r omega. But otherwise, it was, otherwise it was quite similar. Um, yeah, it's, it's all the way up there now. But yeah, without this r omega, it's quite, it's, it's basically the exact same thing. And you can check that. Um, and that makes sense. Basically, if you're letting it rotate, it's gonna, you're going to have to apply less force because you're allowing it to sort of release the momentum by rotating. So part C is, what is the angular velocity that, if there's no resisting torque, so basically if no one's applying any torque, that means the left-hand side of zero. So left-hand side equals zero, and that means um, R omega has to equal to Q over beta. Omega. Omega equal to, equal to Q ran. So that's the frequency that would rotate um, if basically uh, you don't have any torque, you don't have any friction at all. Uh, that's the frequency that would naturally rotate. So what that tells you is this, these sprinklers, these things are designed, um, like if you want it to rotate faster, you, you know, make the whole size smaller, that makes more momentum come out, um, or you, uh, change the number of heads, or you uh, change, or you decrease decrease r. Okay, or you just shove a bunch of fluid through it, okay? and that kind of makes sense. But of course, there's always a little bit of resisting torque. Um, but the small, less the resisting torque you have, the closer you're going to be approximating this. I think that's like a record. This problem is probably kind of three parts, so it does, we just, it, it does take some time to do. Um, but that's the only angular momentum problem we're going to do before the quiz. Um, uh, they're all basically just like Springer problems. So you've got to consider orifices, and uh, I would say the hardest part is really the second part, where you have to uh, basically consider the separate angular momentum per unit mass and the uh, uh, fluxes a uh, different way. So you have to go through this calculation. There's no way. Some problems there's multiple ways to do, but this one you really do have to consider. Hey, Doctor Who. Yeah. In that last value that's at the very bottom of the page, that rho r q times r omega minus q over a n. Yeah. Where's that rho r q coming from? There's a c hat under there. A rho r. Um, it came. It just came from. I I kind of did a Frankenstein of the, this r and this r. So these ends cancel, and then the remainder is that. So it comes from part of the M dat and comes from the number of heads. Yep, I got it. Thank you. Uh, Doctor Who. Yeah. The, uh, the T shaft. So you wrote like resisting torque. Stationary. Yep. What is S dot T dot? Uh, such that. Oh. Rotates. Such that it rotates. All right. Okay, so like I said, uh, all of the, like the washing machine problem, they're all basically very similar to this, to this problem. 
All right. Uh, all right, let's go to board one. All right, so that is one problem on the quiz. One of them is going to be something that's like this rotating sprinkler. Um, the other one is going to be following um, going to be using this conservation of energy. So let's talk about that now. Um, and there, there are basically three versions of conservation of energy that are that look very similar, but basically have the same have the same units. Um, so let's. Um, this is page two twenty six from the book. Oh, so that pump, pump, power. All right, so let's see. So this is the part of the course that you get into pumps and turbines. And uh, what they do is they add energy to the fluid. Um, OK, so the pumps, they kind of look like this because they got like this rotating turbine inside. Right. This is supposed to be a turbine thing. Okay, and um, uh, let's make. You got D1 and D2. So in this problem, you're given um, D1 is equal to 3.5 inches, D2 is equal to 1 inch. I know I didn't really draw it like that, but it doesn't matter. D1. Is equal to 18 psi. P2 is equal to 60 psi. Q is equal to 300 gallons per minute. All right, this is a new variable. Feet, pound per lbm. U, um, upside down carrot. Angry bird's eyebrow, whatever you want to call it. This is basically denotes the uh, to, uh, basically a energy per unit volume, but due to a temperature increase. What's the foot pound or the what? Um, foot pound over um, LBM pound mass. Um, as opposed to pound of uh, force, but this that whole thing is supposed to be units of energy. This book is definitely only used by Americans because foot pound is like a pretty awkward, pretty awkward unit. Um, and the goal find power. Um, Pump power. How much pump, if the pump is basically, you know, making the fluid go from one orifice to another, but increasing its pressure, like you know it's only 18 psi, kind of like in your bike tire and it's going to 60 psi, and it's going at this much flow rate, and it's increasing in temperature, you had two is higher than you had one by this amount. How much is the pump putting in, in power? And that's a unit we call W dot net. All right, so this is clearly not a conservation of angular momentum or mass or linear momentum problem. It requires us to track how much this thing is increasing in energy. So this is actually going to be a flashback to your thermo class. Um, you've got this conservation of energy equation. And it's, it's quite similar, except now we actually have to consider orifices. Um, and we also have to consider that you could give a similar problem to this, and they could ask you to do the answer in terms of, in terms not in terms of um, energy per time, but in terms of this thing called head, so, which is basically units of length. Uh, what are those symbols above U two and U one? Uh, those are upside down carrots. Um, is there a real word for that? Angry bird eyebrow. What, do, what do they represent? I've never seen that symbol before. It's just because they don't like, because real carrots are for um, 
or for vectors, and this is just for something that upside down carrots. No one, does anyone, yeah, no, yeah. That's also the angry bird eyebrow. All right, so for this one, this problem we gotta use um, the energy equation. And we're gonna have to derive, we have to, there's like a couple different versions of this. In the book, there's, it goes on for pages and pages. I will try to basically, I'll give two versions of this on the quiz that basically, uh, well, there's actually, yeah, I'll give two versions. Um, this is also called the first law of thermodynamics. And I would say these energy problems are really a matter of plugging and chugging. There's really no vectors. It's just you got to really understand what's positive and what's negative. Um, Let's do E row. E row dv plus E row u dot n hat dA is equal to q dot net plus w net. So they call that net in kind of controlling. Yes. All right. So, a, a few things. Um, e, um, so this is a change of energy. And uh, this problem on the left is a steady state problem. Unless they're asking for something that changes with time, you're basically going to ignore that first. Um, this flux of energy. I intentionally put the uh, row here because this is going to be m dot. And this is the um, rate of heat and work transfer. And uh, you're going to have to keep it. Uh, you're going to have to keep track of both. For example, in this pump problem, you had the u, the u hat, and the u hat two minus u hat one. That's where that q dot net is going to go in. And the whole goal of this problem is to figure out w dot net. How much is the pump doing to make the fluid change this way? All right, so the, this is, E is defined as, again, our U hat, our U hat, U squared over two. Oh, so the whole reason why they have to have that hat is because we're getting to the part of the course that we're running out of um, letters. It'll, U is standing for energy, but it's also standing for velocity. So anytime you want the energy one, you use this. All right, so, and I think I will put this on the, on the cheat sheet. There's total stored. This should definitely go on your notes stored um, for the quiz. Total stored energy per unit mass. All right. So that's that 20 foot pound per pound mass. Okay. And Internal energy is, that's how we denote something that's changing in temperature is changing its internal energy. Because, uh, you know, its momentum, everything else could sort of stay the same. Um, you're familiar with this one. This is the kinetic energy. And clearly, everything on the, so the left is per unit mass. Everything on the right is also per unit mass. But I just don't want to write it. And that pump problem, it wasn't on an incline, but a lot of the problems on the homework is on, are on an incline. Um, uh, that's basically, and that's basically gravitational energy. Okay. All right. So from thermo, From thermo, basically, we have this. Okay, so what? 
So let's talk about why that top equation is true. So from thermo, um, you have basically the stored energy in the system So the first law of thermodynamics says you've got a, a, a system. The amount of energy that's changing per unit time is equal to basically the amount of the heat um, that goes in and the work that is, that's transferred. And we always have, the reason why these signs are the way they are is because we have this notation that says um, w dot net is positive if work is done on the line. So this is a matter of sign notation. Just like we had to make an arbitrary decision about pressure being positive um, when it's pushing, pushing you in. Um, All right, so the next step is for the system. Then we can add in. So you just consider them occupying the same uh, space and time. Reynolds transport theorem gives us part of what we need. The rest of it's going to come from conservation of from the first law of thermodynamics. The Reynolds transfer theory applied to this variable E, energy per unit of mass, tells us the amount of accumulating in the system. Oh, that's wrong. Yeah, that's fine. Um, can be tracked by looking at the amount of accumulating control volume plus what's fluxing in and out of the control volume. Okay. And if we put them together, we get the thing we want. That is the form of the equation that we're going to be using. Um, now, OK, so these are word problems. So sometimes they'll give you, like, for example, that previous problem, they said this heat in is going to be given by how much your temperature is increasing. There are a couple of different ways uh, Q dot can change. So Q dot is always, let's energy transferred to CV because of temperature difference. So basically, there's got to be one of them's got to be hotter, the control volume or the outsides. Um, 
And uh, we won't talk about this in depth, but you'll learn about this in your heat transfer class. There's basically three ways heat can be transferred. One through radiation, like infrared particles moving. Another one through conduction, where you have a really conductive material that transfers the heat. And uh, the other one through moving fluids. Um, that's primarily what happens in air, liquids. That you got hot fluids that, move, that just literally walk to one place or another. Um, and again, we have the notation that Q dot is equal to positive if, it's in, if you basically have it coming into the control volume, negative if it's going out of the control volume. And Q dot is equal to zero if it's what's called adiabatic. And sometimes you, you might see that in, for adiabatic. Uh, adiabatic just means that the temperature of the insides and outsides are sufficiently similar at all times so that you're not transferring any heat. All right. Now there are two ways work can be transferred, um, but they both uh, associate with basically forces on moving boundaries. So the rate of work transfer is called power. Okay, and the key thing is, it's work is transferred across the across the control surface boundary, uh, the uh, control surface boundary. So that little figure that we drew in the beginning, we had like a little turbine, and this thing is spinning at some frequency omega. And you can imagine a control line is going to cut through this thing, so cut through this turbine. Um, in this case, W dot is equal to going to be the, the torque on the shaft times the frequency omega, angular velocity. Okay. So if you know, you know, you got this to be a really viscous fluid like water, then you're going to have a huge amount of shaft torque, and you could have a low uh, angular velocity. Okay. We defined the shaft net in to be w dot shaft in minus w dot shaft out. A pump is the opposite from a wind turbine. A, turbine. a wind turbine takes energy going in, a pump turns stuff and changes the fluid momentum. Um, so, so this is part A, rotating shaft, almost done here. And part B is a normal stress acting over a distance. So um, we don't really have that here because we have rigid pipe walls, but you could have a problem where you basically, instead of having the shaft, you basically have a piston. Um, so you have, and this is a piston. So that would be basically um, F times U. Okay. The force times the velocity. Okay, uh, we're a minute over time.